Okay, Wednesday afternoon, September 28th. We are in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur on the Jewish calendar. I cannot believe that we are here already ahead of a year. We know it's an agricultural year, but it is a year they celebrate like we do in January. They do, even though the biblical New Year is springtime. But uh, we're right there between the days. We're headed to the days of Sukkot. If you've never built a sukkah, stay tuned. Come plug in, be a part of us. We have a wonderful time. That's all I'll say about that now because our study is really in Bereshit, in Genesis. Chapter 11, verse 9 is where we'll pick up today, continuing from last week and where we left off. We had just really come through the Tower of Babel. We saw the collapse of Babel. We saw that the name really was Babalu initially, which meant gate of the gods or gate of the heavens. We know that there was astrological worship here. We know that they built like a cigarette, not that they were trying to build as all the way up into heaven, but to make a place for the gods to come down from the heavens and commune with man, accept their worship, et cetera, et cetera. They've gone so far away from worshiping the God of creation to be worshiping the way he created instead and to have these false gods. God, they were not being obedient to God. He had commanded them to go out and fill the face of the earth. They decided to come together. We have Nimrod in the head. We know that he was against God, a mighty hunter of souls against God. It was not a compliment the way it was said about him. And we know that, that he was encouraging them to come under his control. He wanted to defy God. He wanted the position of God really is what I see in it. I see Satan influencing him the way Satan did to himself when he in the very throne room of heaven of God um, decided that that should be his throne. And we know the rest of the history of that, do we not? So God saw them. It wasn't that he came down to see them, but it shows it was time that he was going to act judicially. He came in with his judgment because they were using their skills and their they were all of one lip, as the Hebrew says, all of one language. They had uh, come together in that way to build. Um, it was so bad, so um, evil that like we read about in the coming tribulation days, the deception of the truth would be so thick that if it were possible, even the elect would have been deceived is what the scriptures say for the future. And we see that here. We know God had put the gospel into the stars. It was being so corrupted that if God allowed it to continue, the message eventually would not be known. It would have been just absolutely succumbed to the darkness that was rising up and God said no. So he brought judgment on the very thing that united them, which was their language. We're going to see uh, one family come out of this that keeps that godly family line the same way we saw of Seth earlier. And we talked about seven generations from Adam. You had Lamech who was faithful and you had the other, another Lamech named later. But in that line, that was the ungodly line. We'll follow the godly line once again. That godly line being Shem and coming down through him that will eventually lead to the Messiah it's very unlikely that he and his family, being godly, had any part of what was going on with the rest of the world. Probably almost like it was in the days of Noah, where it came down to just his family. There were more than eight, I believe, at this time who were believing and who were being obedient. But still, if God allowed it to continue, it would have come to that point. And God said he'd never destroy the world again with a flood. So he does not let it go to that point of judgment, but he brings this judgment of confounding their languages, and it goes from the name Babalu to the Hebrew name given to it all along, which is Babel, which is confusion, which is, as we say today, you're babbling, you're not making sense. Well, if Shem and his family were not a part of it, then there would have been no need to touch their language. Their language, we know, was Hebrew because the scriptures were written in this. It could have been the Ar Aramaic, it could have been the, the ancient Hebrew and the related languages that are close to that, but probably that is the pure language that was the first language. We can't say that dogmatically. There's no scripture and verse where I can say, it says Adam spoke Hebrew, but it just seems likely that if the judgment was a change in language, Shem's family would have been exempt from that judgment. His language would have continued on. So we think it was Hebrew, He's going to continue on in that um, godly line. 
We're going to study that, as I mentioned, as soon as we get through this judgment, uh, this with Babel, with um, the, the other nations, but they weren't other nations until now. Now they're going out. We talked last week about how the genes came up predominantly so that you have the people groups that you know of today in the different languages that you know of today. So we see clearly at this time that this was the judgment on that third dispensation that we come into called human government. We, we know that the beginning was innocence. This was in the Garden of Eden. We know that Adam and Eve sinned. There was a judgment. They came into conscience. In conscience, you have your first murder. So much for going by your conscience. We see man fail. Then God brought them into the time when Noah came out of the ark, starting the family again, the people. God gave them human government. Human government does not totally go away. We have human government today. We cannot have no law. No one wants to live with no law. The anarchy that it would be would be horrendous. But we see God's judgment fall on this human government, this human dispensation in the, the Tower of Babel is it completed and the people are thrust out because they go out with those who they can understand. In that God did not divide families, families went out. So you have your basically, for lack of a better word right now, your tribes begin. But uh, we touched on it a little bit. Last week we'll touch on it a little more this week that we see culture developing simultaneously around the world in different places flies in the face of evolution which says oh no we had a stone age and we had the ice age and we had the neanderthals we had the cavemen we had you know all this develop over such a long period of time well then how did we have all these what we call today nations about the same time developing in all the fields well god gave man talent it didn't develop because he got smarter if man's getting smarter what's wrong with our world today i don't think it's getting smarter and i don't think anyone how can i say it nicely is dumb enough to believe it is getting better that's not nice but it's true okay so smart dumb i mean i had to use the analogy i'm sorry that this world is getting better today you know we're worried about burning ourselves out with our son we're worried about you know the life expectancy suffering consequences there's all kinds of issues they're worrying about the glaciers melting there the ozone the you know all of these issues beside the fact just look at man is man really doing a better job of judging and taking care of himself and his world today than a thousand years ago than a couple thousand years ago ages so if you want to try to prove me wrong bring it on we'll go at it <laughs> but i think <laughs> i think everybody's in agreement here so what we see is that babel became the name to stand for what was in opposition of god now when we say somebody's babbling we're not saying you're opposing god but that's the way the terminology is used here at this time and with the scripture yes Dora. uh is this a misprint when the bible said that Shem had a son two years. Is it two years after the blood? Uh -huh. And we'll talk about that in just a few verses. You're reading ahead. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's, it's not an imprint. Oh, Shem did. Okay. Yeah. So that's yeah. coming. You're just a little ahead of us. I think you're in about verse 10 and I'm verse 8. <laughs> oh, eight. So verse 8. So I so, think I said nine. I think I said we're starting in nine, but eight's where they're being scattered. They stopped building the city. The judgment came. Nine is where they're being scattered abroad, the face of the earth. And now we're going to come into Tim. So my fault if I led you wrong. But I want to give you a little more background of one more thing that I think it is um, it's, it's important. It's important for us to understand and to know and to recognize. Because as I just said, Babel's standing for everything in opposition to God. That's where we're seeing it. It's also interesting, side note, that it's interesting, I think I said it last week, a Babylonian garment, you know, uh, like a robe or something made in Babylon was the first sin recorded when Israel entered into the promised land and they had the great victory in Jericho and then they had the great defeat in Ai because sin had entered the camp. They weren't to take anything in, in the victory the, and Achan took gold, I think it was gold, he took some sort of monetary and a Babylonian garment. 
Very interesting. Oh, Babylon's goodness. nothing but trouble. That was the Babylonian. It was a Babylonian silver and the gold and, and the Babylonian the garment. garment. That the robe that was just such awe that he had to take it. And then he buries it to hide it to not get in trouble. But God sees. Joshua, Joshua chapter 7, verse 21, if you want to read it on your own. So I feel like when they oh, Joshua oh, 7, yes. the verse 21. It's in your cross references. Which remind me before you leave today, I have the next page of cross references for those of you who are in person. And the rest of you, it's been in your mailbox for a couple of days in your email. Um, and if you're not getting them, you've got to let me know so that we get that straightened out. Okay, so we know Nimrod was the head. Okay, I want to give you a little background about his family because it is relevant to us even today and especially in, in times that are coming. Nimrod had a wife. The wife's name was Samirmas. If I'm pronouncing that wrong, forgive me. I don't know Babylonian, okay? But I'm going to call her Samirmas. Um, she reputedly originated what is called the Babylonian mystery religion. If you hear someone talk about that, this is the roots of it. She considered herself a high priestess. So you've got your first high priest, priestess. And according to ancient lore, notice I'm saying this is not biblical, but this is the teaching that's been passed down to this day. She outlived Nimrod by 42 years. Wow. So Nimrod's died, Samarimus is still living, and she gave birth to a son after Nimrod had died, and she claimed that he miraculously was conceived. Then she named him Tammuz. Okay, so you've got a miraculous conception, the birth of a son after the father has died. And she went so far as to hail him as a savior and claim he's the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. Now we know that, that Eve looked for the seed that was promised to come through her. We know that's Messiah who will eventually come in that line. We know that we're following that. We'll follow that in Shem's line shortly. But here, Samirmas is claiming her son is a fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. This is Satan's conspiracy. And I'll remind you again and again and again. Does he ever originate? No. Does he ever have an original thought? No. Solomon said there's nothing new under the sun. And Solomon was right. <laughs> he had a lot of wisdom. Uh, and here we just see Satan try to counterfeit everything of God because it's all he can do is throw out a smoke screen, bring a deception, counterfeit the real. How do we call out the counterfeit? Study the real. Know the truth. Well, this one, Samirmas, is because she's given birth to this savior, this miraculous conception, is uh, began to be worshipped. She's the one that is called the queen of heaven. When you read that in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 7, 18, we read that they're making cakes to the queen of heaven. They're worshipping the queen of heaven. That's where, That's where it comes from. In Judges, I think it's chapter 2 and verse 13. I think I put it in your cross references, and it is Judges 2, verse 13. It's called Ashtoreth. You've probably heard that name more than Samirmas. But this one that says, I'm a high priestess, I'm the queen of heaven, is the one that's being worshipped as we follow down the line. She claimed she and her son were both divine. So at this point now, you've got the start of the worship of the mother and the child. Okay? Now, that would have been that fun. Yeah. Uh, we definitely see the infrastructure there. You're uh, you're just saying it a little faster than I was going to bring it out. But if you're if something's clicking in your mind, yes, you're on the right track. This is the development of what becomes that and what will go on. And I'll tell you about that again in just a moment. At this point, though, where where I'm saying the, the beginning of the worship of the mother and child. For those of you who have been in the gospel, the stars with me. Remember the, the constellation Virgo showed the virgin, showed the child that would be conceived, and with the alignment of the stars in such a way, the wise man who had learned to study the scripture of the stars was able to know when Messiah had been born, and they came on their way to Jerusalem, where the king of the Jews should be, because that's the capital of the land of the Jews, and they came to worship him. 
So here's the counterfeit of what God put in the stars. You see it carried down from the Tower of Babel. You see it continuing on. Well, again, she claimed that she was divine, her son was divine, and even went so far as to say it was Nimrod reborn, even though she gave him the name Tammuz. But later, he is deified as the chief god. So she's the high priestess, he's the chief god. Um, in Babylon, the name came to be Marduk or Marodok, if you see any of those in your um, literature or your studies. And Tammuz, the son, the child from, well, from Samirmas, that's all I can say, um, became worshipped as the sun god, S-U-M, okay, that he, he was the sun god. Now, notice how close you're getting to the son of God in the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. See how close he gets the counterfeit? And yet, we know he falls so far from the truth. That Tammuz became to be worshipped, and Tammuz's name is changed, a name you are familiar with. You call it Baal. Hebrews, it's Baal. But when you hear Baal, the God that's worshipped much in the Old Testament among the nations that were around Israel, and it was brought into Israel, sadly. Um, it, I could say it, but I have to put it in quotes today, in the Palestinian countries, and I have to say that because Palestine's not a state, never was. Uh, but in those peoples, um, this is the Baal, the Baal that they worship. First time that you see it, I think the first time coming into Israel is through Jezebel, the wicked queen of King Ahab, Ahab. Uh, and you see from then on, it's, it's more than a thorn in Israel's side. Anyway, later, Tammuz was supposedly killed by a wild boar and resurrected. Now, they had... At that time when he was killed, they decided because he was 40 years old that there should be 40 days of weeping for Tammuz. So they started that prior to his being resurrected. They started the 40 days of weeping for Tammuz. And that's followed down of the 40 days. And I just have to call it out, okay? What it morphed into or continued to be is the 40 days of Lent before the resurrection of the sun. You can see again the parallel, but it's it's the camouflage, it's the substitute, it's the fake, it's not true. Where do I get this that they're doing the 40 days of worship? Let me prove to you that I'm not just saying, but that I actually have scripture to back me up. And that is in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 14. I will turn to that here in a moment. And read... Then he brought me to the entrance of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz. There's your fact in scripture. Again, this is called the Babylonian mystery religion. It began at this time. It can be traced all the way through Roman times. You have Rome, uh, the, the great Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. You have Christianity, quote, develop under Constantine. You can follow it on and you can follow it literally all the way down into the tribulation period where it will culminate. It is called Mystery Babylon in Revelation 17. This is what I'm talking about why I'm bringing it out to you because here is the start in Genesis 11. There is the end, Revelation 17, when the religious system is destroyed. And it's destroyed at that time fully and completely by the Antichrist because he wants the worship for himself. So he's not going to have any, any threat to his being the one soul that is worshiped this whole time. Why do I bring that out? Because it's very interesting, the comparison. I'm sorry, I've got one kitty landing on top of another kitty and doesn't even know because she's under a blanket. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, do you like that? Don't worry about it. It's okay. They survived. I'm back on track. Okay. Nimrod, who we've been talking about, who wanted to be like a god, wanted all the worship, wanted everybody or to worship in the way he declared because he was worshiping the heavens also. But what do we see in Nimrod that makes us think about Revelation chapter 17 that I just mentioned? Because I just told you somebody is going to destroy that mystery religion. That someone who is going to destroy it is none other than the Antichrist. So, very interesting. 
Nimrod, and Antichrist. Nimrod name means let us rebel. Antichrist means against Christ. Very similar names, very similar attitudes, very similar frame of mind. Let's look real quickly at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Read just a tiny bit about this Antichrist. I can't type well today. Sorry, folks. It'll take me just a moment to get there. 2 Thessalonians 2. We're going to read verses 8 through 10. Um, another name for the Antichrist is the lawless one. And anybody who thinks that they don't want laws, consider even um, driving on the road with no laws. Don't have to stop at road. Don't have lights. Don't have to go to the speed limit. Don't have to merge. Can you imagine what driving would be like? You know, so no, we really don't want uh, the laws to be, thank you, Roger, to, to be done away with. But 2 Thessalonians 2, chapter 8 says, Then that lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. So we know when the Antichrist sees his demise is when the Lord comes, he sees the Lord come. And at his appearance, the Antichrist is destroyed. When does that happen? Very end of the tribulation. When Messiah returns in second coming to the earth. Okay, that's when he will be destroyed. But verse 9 says, that is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. I'm talking about the Antichrist here because I breathed in between and sidetracked you. Let me make that clear. This Antichrist, this lawless one, He's coming in accord. He's one in sync with Satan. In fact, he's really empowered by Satan because it says that with all power and signs and false wonders. He's going to be able to do things that are considered miraculous because Satan, Satan, is empowering him. Verse 10 says, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. The love of the truth. Who is the truth? Jesus. Jesus. Yeshua Jesus. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. When they will not receive Yeshua, the truth, Jesus, when they don't love him, then they serve the other. They'll fall under the, the power of the Antichrist. They will see him do these things. They will worship him like a god. They're going to think he is god and that's exactly what he wants we know matthew 24 tells us that he puts an image of himself in the temple to be worshiped as god and if you don't bow down and worship him you don't live literally yes okay i'm sorry i'm all confused okay and we haven't even started to uh get israel going and the tribes and all this good stuff and they're already conniving or whatever you want to call it this enterprise thing what I'm saying is Nimrod is a picture of the it foreshadows what's going to come in Antichrist. That we're going to see a comparison because Satan used Nimrod like he's going to use the Antichrist. And and there's a lot of similar before Christ was born, so that they even before the devil was already working to exactly the people. Exactly. He tries to deceive the people. He tries to stop there being a people so that Messiah can't even be born. He tries to devour the child when the child is born. Remember, Herod put out the, the net to kill all the baby male babies and they're two years of age. He, when he can't stop him then, he goes after him. We see even the temptation, etc. But we see the death of Yeshua Jesus. Satan thinks I've won, and three days later, he knows he's lost it all. He knows he's going down in defeat. Yet, what does he do through tribulation time? He gets the masses to follow him still, as many as he can deceive. He goes after, I see him in the face of God saying, you know, I'll grab one more. You know, I'll grab one more. If I'm going down, I'm going to take as many with me as I can. He doesn't ever come to the point where he repents of his evil and where he regrets and where he would fall on his face before god no he defies god all the way up to his last moment when it's after the tribulation after the thousand years that the lord has ruled in peace he still goes through the world then deceiving as many as he can come on follow me we'll take the lord out i'll be 
I'll be God and you all be happier under me than you are under him. And at that point, when it comes up in the face of, of God, in the face of the Lord, at that point, that's when God says, it's over. And he's cast in a lake of fire forever. Never able to bother a, a person ever again. But all the way through, he knows his end. He can read. He can hear. He was in God's eternal heaven. He knows his end. And yet he has the audacity to think he can thwart God's plan. He can change it. He can find that one that he can work through to do his dastardly deeds. And that's finally the Antichrist. Yeah, yeah. But in the meantime, initially he tried it with Nimrod. We see many different times where we can see foreshadowing. We know it's foreshadowing because we know the greater is yet to come. So, yes, even before. I mean, why did he put this fake thought for Samirmus to declare, oh, this is a virgin birth child. This one, it was resurrected. What are they doing? They're copying what God's told his people he will do, <laughs> that one will come virgin born, one will die and be resurrected. And Stone jumps in there and says, here it is, here it is, here, and just lies to the people and they believe it and worship it. But Tabu never died or whatever his name is for the people, did he? No. No, and he never resurrected either. <laughs> he's dead. He's still dead. He's, he's still dead. E E D dead. Okay. <laughs> yes. No. No. Satan can only mimic so far. He can't pull it all off. That's why and it's sidetracked. But that's why, in my humble opinion, and I tell you that when the Antichrist, um, it says that the, in the in the English. You can't tell, even when you get to the original languages, it's hard to tell whether it, it talks about this one who seems to be dead and yet comes back to life. There's room in it for it to be that someone died and came back to life, but there's also room for it to be it looked like that. And they argue over which is it. Does the Antichrist actually die and get resurrected, or is it just it looked like it? I'm of the opinion it only looked like it because the only one who can give life is the Lord he himself. And I do not believe that he resurrects the Antichrist. So I think it's as close as Satan could get. He's tried here with Nimrod and Tammuz. He hasn't quite succeeded. He's tried it other times. He's going to try again. He's going to use the same lie. He just about perfects it because he's going to make it look so real that the world's going to think, wow, this one came back from the dead. He must be God. I'll bow down and I'll worship him. And that's exactly what Satan wants, because at that point he's indwelt the Antichrist. So when you're worshiping the Antichrist, you'd be worshiping him. And that was the best he could do. But no, Tammuz is dead. Tammuz didn't resurrect. She didn't have a miraculous conception. She had an affair. <laughs> no nice way to put it, but we're all adults here, okay? And it's possible she had the affair before he died. It could be. I don't know how long between when he died and when she gave birth. I, I don't know, but whichever way, whether it was within nine months, so it could have been his child or not, you know, no, no. This was an absolute lie, lie. But you speak a lie loud enough and long enough, the people believe it, and that's what is so sad. And well, we're so so uh, easy to be fooled. Yes. I mean, they tell us lies and we believe it all the time. Exactly, exactly, and, and that's that's my whole point, yes. You know, it's amazing, and it's amazing how hard it is to get people to believe the truth. They'd rather believe the lie. Sad, very, very sad. So, he, the names are similar. We see this um, attitude, you know, what they're like, this coming against God, this fakeness. Um, Nimrod headed a great conspiracy against God. Remember, God said, go out, fill the earth. He says, no, come together, let's build, let's make our empire and also as God on our empire. That's basically what he was saying. And what does the Antichrist do? I'm going to take you back on our way back toward Genesis. We're going to stop off in Daniel chapter 11 that speaks about what the Antichrist does. And in Daniel 11, verses 36 and 37 is where we want to look. And here we read, sorry, it takes a while to get down there on the tablet. Then the king, and this is called the willful king. That's a, a name for the Antichrist. He's given many different names besides Antichrist. So then the willful king or the king will do as he pleases. 
He will exalt and magnify himself above every God. That's what I was just telling you about. Antichrist wants all the worship. He's greater than all the gods. He's going to tell you better than the sun god, better than the moon god, better than the god of, of other parts of nature, better than the god of whatever, you know, they're worshiping. And he'll speak monstrous things against the god of gods, against the one who is the one true and living god. And this willful king, this Antichrist, he will prosper until the indignation is finished. If you've been with me long enough, you know indignation is another word for the tribulation. Isaiah 26, 20 also calls it the indignation, but from the description around it, we know it's the tribulation period. So he's going to prosper until the tribulation is finished, for that which is decreed will be done. He'll show no regard for the gods of his fathers or for the desire of women, nor will he show regard for any other god, for he will magnify himself above them all. Okay. It even says, and, and if I went on, that the military god, you know, if you have the military as your god, you look to fortresses, you know, this, this is what will save us, our military, whatever you put up like a god, he, is, he's, he doesn't care what you think a god is, he's going to tell you, I'm god, I'm better than that, you worship me, I'm the one that's going to take care of you. That's what the Antichrist does. Isn't that what Nimrod did? You don't need to do what God told you to do. You don't need to go out and wander out there. You just stay here and remember he was a mighty hunter. It might have even been true that it was against wild animals. We don't know, but he was a hunter for their souls. Um, three times Nimrod is described as mighty. And we see also the Antichrist described in that same way. Where we just came from in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9, I failed to hold on to it that he's described as mighty there. And again, Nimrod was a hunter of man's souls, and Antichrist will destroy any who do not worship him. So he's hunting their souls also in that way. Mm -hmm. Nimrod was looked upon like a king, and the Antichrist is even called a king. I read it for you here in Daniel eleven thirty six. The king will do as he pleases, or the willful king if you have the King James. Either way. So you've got both of them given the title king. Nimrod's headquarters, Babylon. Where's the Antichrist's headquarters? Babylon. Babylon. Interestingly enough, Revelation 18 makes it clear. You can also read on your own Isaiah, Yeshia, verses 14. I'm sorry, chapter 14, verses 4 through 7, to see that Babylon is, is the headquarters. Isaiah 14, 4 to 7, and Revelation 18 speaks to the commercial to the political, to the system. Revelation 17 speaks to the religious, but 18 speaks to uh, Revelation 17 and 18. 17 and 18. And 18 chapters. Oh, those well, chapters. Yeah, well, 18 shows the um, the headquarters, the physical headquarters, the, the place. 17 talks about the religion. 18 talks about an actual place where, you know, it's yeah, what about 19? the government. Revelation 19, victory in our Lord, <laughs> coming back, ruling and reigning, chapter, um, tells us that we've been roped in his righteousness, we come back with him, and he annihilates the Antichrist. That's chapter 19 of Revelation. Amen. It's a wonderful chapter. Okay, and lastly, I think, or do I have more? Yeah, lastly, Nimrod's supreme ambition. He wanted to make a name for himself. He wanted to exalt himself above all in actuality, he made a name for himself. We're 4,000 years later talking about him. He did make a name for himself. Not the name he wanted because he's not worshipped as God by us. We know better. But the Antichrist has that same ego. He wants a name above all names and he wants all worship to come to him. That was Second Thessalonians chapter 2 where we were a little earlier about verse 4. Um, talks about that. If you read 2 Thessalonians 2 from the beginning through, uh, I don't remember, 8, 9, 10, 11, somewhere in there, it's all talking about the Antichrist and what he is like. And so you can get more there. But very interesting. Satan's got this formula, I'll put it that way. He's got this formula in his mind and he starts and tries with Nimrod. He fails. He's going to start and try through time. And the best, but yet the worst, is the Antichrist when he does the most damage, but he gets absolutely stopped. And his 
puppet on earth gets destroyed as when the Lord returns, as we were talking about Revelation 19, and it goes down in defeat. So the whole account of what happened at Babel with this anti-God dictator, it was organized rebellion against God. That's basically what it was. It was a direct distrust of God. Um, God. God had told man he would take care of him. He was to go out, fill the earth. It was, you know, not believing that. Remember, we even saw the ziggurat was pitched so that it would be waterproof, almost as if they believed another flood would come and they wanted their tower for their God to survive. Um, but what it shows us is when you distrust God's promise and his plan, you go awry. And that's what happened back before the flood. Remember, every evil thought of man, every, every thought of man, every imagination of man was only evil continually. They weren't worshiping God. They were in rebellion against God, and it became more and more evil. Well, I'm going to take us from the flood. I'm going to take us up to today. Time has passed. Thousands of years have passed. We've made progress in many ways. We, we live in a way that shows progression from that time. We have governments and organizations. We have all kinds of things that have developed since the flood. But has it made man better? No. Some might say, well, we're better off. Yeah, you might live a more rich life. You might live a more comfortable life than in a tent somewhere. But has it made mankind better? Has it made man better? No. No, absolutely not. You cannot tell me man is better today than he was at, at the time of Noah's flood, at the time of Babylon, of, I'm sorry, of Babel, of the Tower of Babel. We see it all around us. We see the worship of the false gods. We see the evil that's been in the name of their gods. We see life taken in those names. It's, it's horrible, but no, we do not see man better. That's why I was saying earlier, it flies in the face of evolution. If man's getting better, Show me how and show me where. Yeah, no, it's not there. But God's got his plan, and I love it. Now God will begin to make man better. He's going to do it, and he's going to start as he always starts. He's going to start with a man. But the man that he's going to start with is one who will do his will, and even though he won't do it perfectly, God's plan will continue through this man. I'm going to introduce you to this very special man very shortly. If you don't know who, stay tuned. <laughs> okay, we've got to take it in order though. So go back with me to Genesis 11. We're going back to verse 10 now. And now we'll get close to answering Dora's question a few minutes ago. Verse 10 says, these are the records of the generations of Shem. Okay, remember when we see generation, we know we're reading history, we're reading the genealogical lines, genealogy, okay? Shem's genealogy is picked up again. Why Shem's? Why not Japheth's? Why not Ham's? We've got those, but that was before. Why are we going to focus and see a continuation of Shem? Why Shem? Why are we reading about his genealogy? What's the important reason why? Because he's got follower of God. He's a godly line, and who is going to come? Messiah. Messiah is going to come from the line of Shem. That's why it's so important that we have this line, the godly line. So, okay? Okay. All right. So, Messiah is going to bring order out of confusion. We've got confusion. We've got Babel. We've got Babylon. Okay? But we're going to see. God's plan not thwarted, and Messiah, who can, can clear up all confusion, comes from this line. Now, from chapter 10 and verse 1 through chapter 11 and verse 9, is it 9? Um, yes, okay. Actually, up until, I'm going to say the first line of verse 10, when we have it written this way, these are the records of the generations of Shem. That's kind of like if he had been writing a letter, he'd been putting down the genealogy and he signed his name. This is where Shem is done and the next one's going to pick up, okay? So, and by the way, if you want Messiah's line from Shem, go to Luke 3. Luke 3 will give you the names that you're going to be hearing as we continue studying in Genesis. That's why I'm not taking you to Luke right now. But probably from chapter 10 where it started, 
all the records of the nations that went out and all the way down to here now was Shem that kept those records. And it probably was taken up by Terah or Terah, as you say, look down at verse 27 of chapter 11. And we see there in, it says, now these are the records or the history, the genealogy of the generations of Terah. So probably Terah wrote the next part. And again, remember these are like you pass down your genealogical records to your children. It's being passed down. When it finally comes to the time when Moshe is writing the five books of, of, um, of the Tanakh, I'll put it in my Hebrew terms, the five books of our original covenant, he is the author of the books. He's given the credit for it, but he compiled, he brought together. He didn't have to have God teach him so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so, as is recorded here, he had those records. They were given to him, and they were carried on down. He wove it together and filled in everything in between. Okay, so we're still going to learn about Shem's life here. Um, go back up to verse 10, but again, this is probably where his keeping of the records ended, which makes sense, because you've got to pass it down at some point. You can't do it when you're Death. Okay. Now, Shem does live for a long time. He outlives Terah, Terah, by 75 years. So it's not that he wasn't alive, but he wasn't the, the responsible person to keep the records going. I'll put it that way. A lot of times in a family, you'll see that one person who keeps the genealogical lines going and they tell somebody else and it keeps on going down. Um, Avram lived 25 years after Shem died. So Tara, his father, had ample opportunity to talk with Shem since Shem lived a number of years after Tara died. So when we compartmentalize these Bible characters and we see them separate, we're doing ourselves a disservice. You need to realize that they were alive at the same time and able to talk to each other. So Shem easily told Tara, here's the generations. Tara being the father of Abram, Avram, Avram's grown up enough that, that he's an adult. He can hear from Shem also. We've got the, the ability for words to be passed down. Even Noah, remember, lived until Terah, um, actually, sorry. Um, okay. Avram was probably born two years after Noah died. We're not 100% dogmatic on that, but if we're reading and understanding the scriptures, correctly. That's how far down it goes. So almost to know it, almost. Um, we, we have the ability for them to be talking to each other and carrying it down. If I'm confusing you, sorry about that. Um, but uh, um, he was, Noah and Tara were alive at the same time. Noah just barely missed Avram. Okay, so now here's your question, Dora. It says here in chapter, in verse 10, Shem was 100 years old and became the father of, and here we go with the name, our, our Pachshad. It can be spelled with a CH. It also can be spelled with an X. So if you see either one in your studies or either one in your scriptures, we're talking about the same person. So Shem was 100 years old when he gave birth. Well, he didn't give birth, but his wife gave birth <laughs> too. And I'm just going to call him Arpa. Okay. Yeah, I finally got my thinking cap on because Shem already had a wife when they were in the book. So two years after they landed. Thank you. Good for Nora. She <laughs> put it together. Did I say Nora? I'm sorry. We've got a Nora in the class too. Good for Dora. <laughs> she put it together and she sees them as real people and you got it. Now, granted, they're having, giving birth at an older age than we do, but Shem was a real person. He did have a wife. His wife went on the ark with him. Remember Noah, Mrs. Noah, then his three sons and their wives, eight, came off of that ark together. Well, Shem and his wife took God at the, his word. He said, be fruitful and multiply, and here comes Arthur. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Arpa is now the 12th generation from Adam. So if you count it down, generation, generation, you've got 12 generations. Through Arpa, I got to say his name right, Arparchak, okay? He leads what will be known as the Hebrew race 
through whom the Messiah will rule the world. And it's interesting that in scripture, 12 is the number for government. So you see God's government, which will be established in the nation of Israel, 12 tribes, 12 <laughs> generations from Adam. Just a, a fun play on numbers. This doesn't, you know, don't take this as gold, but it's just interesting. Now, what's also interesting is he was not Shem's firstborn. He probably was the third son of Shem, okay? The other two aren't mentioned because they're not important in the genealogical line that's leading to Messiah, and that's what is being brought out as what is important. But if you sneak down, go to, or go back, I'm sorry, not down, but go back. Go back to chapter 10 and verse 22, and here in chapter 10 and verse 22, we have the sons of Shem were Alam and Ashur and Aparkhad and Lud and Aram. Okay, so he has five sons. Because Arpa is named third here is why some think that he's the third one. But here's what I'm going to say, and it's just the thought that, that I had, but I don't know any other way to answer it. If he is the third son, then the first two had have been twins, in my opinion, because you don't read about somebody giving birth on the ark. Eight went in, eight came out. We've got two years later. So unless we're talking two years and 11 months and you've got babies nine months, nine months, and nine months, you know, it's a little hard to fit three in there. But if the two were twins, then along comes, it could be. It, but whatever, sometimes we do see an out of order uh, person brought up. And that's what we're seeing. In fact, often we see this in scripture. It's supposed to be the firstborn that carries the name. We know it's the firstborn that eventually gets the double, the birthright, you know, all of that. But often we see God raise up one that's not in that order. And Arpachad is the one that God raises up, brings through, the Messiah comes through his line um, from Shem, and that's why he's given preeminence here over the other two. Instead of saying, well, here's Shem, and then here's Shem's oldest, and then there's the oldest of Shem's oldest. No, we're going through our pocket, son, whatever. <laughs> what a name. Even in the Hebrew, that's a hard one to pronounce. So forgive me. I'll apologize to them when I get to heaven. <laughs> okay. So he also had other sons and daughters. Um, we're going to get that in verse 11. We, maybe we're ready for that. I think we are. And it was two years after the flood, we know. So that tells us how old was Shem when he came off the boat? What? How old was Shem when he came off the boat? 500 years. No, Shem. Uh, Shem. Oh, Shem lived 500 years. Okay. But you just told me that Shem was off the ark for two years, two years. Oh, okay. when he had Arpachah. Okay. okay. 502. And, okay. But I still want Shem. Yeah. Shem was... A hundred, Shem was 100 when he gave birth to Arpachah, okay, or his wife. So there you go. So he was 98 when he came off the boat, okay? That's how we get these numbers that you'll hear and see, okay? He had to be 98 when he came off because two years later, at 100 years of age, he is the daddy of Arpa. okay? So um, that's what, when we put all these together, that's why we're giving them. There's things that we learn from them. Some just interesting and some that end up turning out to be important in the line. Now, Shem lived, and here's where he went ahead of me in the verse 11. He lived 500 years after he became the father of Archad. So if he became the father at 100 and he lived 500 years more, then he lived to be 600, okay? And in the space of that time, he had other sons and daughters. We have no idea who. They're not named, okay? Because they're not important to carry the line down. If God gave us all the names, by right, default, can you imagine? I mean, it's hard enough to keep track of these he did give. <laughs> okay, so this is why. Now, Arpachad does his duty. He lives only 35 years when he becomes a dad. And he becomes a father of Shelah. Okay, so remember 35 years. He was 35 when he gave birth to his son. Okay, now Arpachad lived 403 years after he became a father. So he became a father at 35. He lives to be 438 years. Okay, now in his time, he not only had Shelah, he had other sons and daughters also. 
But do you notice the lifespan? 438 years. I'll point out why in a moment. Let's go to verse 14. Sheila, he's busy too. They want to become daddies fast. So he lives 30 years and he's the father of ever. Um, you might say Eber, but closer to the Hebrew is ever. Okay, now, when you put the numbers together and just trust me if you can't follow it, because I did the math, I worked it out as I was studying it, um, and it wasn't original with me. I had sources that helped me, because believe me, I can get confused in it. But what I want to point out is Shem is 165 when Ever is born, when his grandson is born, okay? Because Shem had Arpachad, Arpachad had Sheila, Sheila had Ever. So that's a great, great grandson. Wow. Yeah, and he was 165 then. Arp, 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 he was 100. Arp was 35 when he gave birth to Sheila, 30 when he fathered Ever, 100 plus 35 plus 30. Shem is 165. Now, the name Ever. We get our word Hebrew from this root, okay? It means one who crosses or cross over, okay? And that's going to be a very important word. At this time, it probably meant he migrated, that Evers is known by his name. He, he lives a life of, of migrating. But we're going to see what that name crossed over means as we come into that one that I want to talk to you about that we're going to talk about for quite a while. That will stay in order. Verse 16. Ever was 34 when he became the father of Peleg. Okay. Now, Peleg, does it tell us right here? Should I read on? I think I should read on. Um, yeah, I'll go ahead and read on. Verse 17. In fact, let me just read through 19 and then go back and break it down for us. Okay. Ever lived 34 years and became the father of Peleg. Ever lived 430 years after he became the father of Peleg, and he had other sons and daughters. That phrase continues on. Peleg lived 30 years, became the father of Reu. And Peleg lived 209 years after he became the father of Reu, and he had other sons and daughters. Okay, so Shem, if we keep adding it up, Shem was 199 when that fifth generation Peleg was born. Peleg lived 239 years. So in the lifetime of Shem, which is probably also Ham and Japheth, his brothers, but in the lifetime of Shem, something significant happened. Look at chapter 10, verse 25, because we studied it probably two weeks ago, and you, you're not going to remember without recalling that we've heard about Pele. In verse 25, and to prove my point, we've got Archaphod, Sheila, Eber in verse 24, Chapter 10, verse 25 says, two sons were born to Eber. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided. So here we are. This is the same Peleg. This is the same thing that's going on. So now, remember we said in chapter 10 when it was telling us where the families went, that it was prior to the Tower of Babel, that we were getting that information because they knew. It's like when you're telling a story and you fill in some of the blanks ahead of time to help people understand. Now it's really happening. Now in Peleg's day, which we have here in chapter 11, we have that dividing of the earth. What is significant because if you look at um, a world map, you can see how the nations look like a puzzle that could have fit together. And if it was all, you know, there weren't big seas to have to get across oceans and so forth. If the land was closer and the people are migrating, we know they're migrating. Ever is one of the names telling us they're migrating. Now we can understand how you could end up with American Indians in America. You could end up with a civilization in South America. That was, again, the time goes back equal to what we're seeing in other areas. How did the people get there? They didn't have planes. They didn't have trains. They didn't have fast cars. They didn't have big boats. We know that nobody knew what Noah was building. It wasn't that it was common. But if the land was close and the peoples who were migrated out and then the land divided, we've got more oceans and water and all in between. That's how people were spread out. So it, it, makes, it makes sense. If it didn't happen that way, God can correct us and tell us later. My concern is not that I'm making sure I'm, I'm 
that I know for fact what the Bible doesn't tell me for fact, but we can understand how this could easily be. It just makes a whole lot of sense because you will have those who will say to you, well, how did the Indians get to America? Because they were here before Christopher Columbus. And how can you have a civilization as developed as in the name in the area that was far removed from Mesopotamia, far removed from Babylon? This would be how, you know, because again, the people were very intelligent. Remember, they've been able to create, to build, not create, I'm sorry, to build cities. They've been able to establish themselves. You don't read anywhere in scripture of the caveman mentality, you know, where they're hitting with their big clubs and carrying the woman by her hair and, you know, have a, a square wheel and, oh, you know, now that it's getting rubbed off, we, we see round better, you know, let's use round, oh, fire. Buy or cook dinner. <laughs> no. Give man a little more credit for that. Okay. Back to where we are. We'll pick up again in verse 19 now then. Um, what I'm hoping to stress through all this is that you're getting an idea. It's real people living in real places, living real lives, not so different from us today. Okay. Verse 19. We have... Peleg lived, oh, I wanted to bring out one more thing because I have read it, but he lived 209 years after he became a father at 30 years, so he only lived 239 years total. Do you notice how we're seeing shorter lives? The, the patriarchal longevity immediately after the flood began to decline. Noah lived 950 years. We had heard of others. We know Methuselah lived 969. We heard of 800 and saw a lot of years. I think Seth was in the 800s. Anyway, now we've had the flood. Noah's 950. His son Shem only lives to 600. That's a big drop. Shem's son, Arpachad, only lives to 438. His son Sheila only lives to 433 years and ever 464 years. Then we see a huge decline again with Pelot. I don't know if that's due to the, that division, if something else happened in the atmosphere that, that helped life to shorten even more. I don't know. The Peleg only lives 239 years. So he lives a fourth of the, the amount of time that Noah lived. And Ra'u, the, the son that comes after that also, verses 20 and 21 will tell us, Ra'u lived, Ra lived 32 years, became the father of Saruk. Ru lived 207 years after he became the father of Saru. So he lived 234 years. He still had other sons and daughters, but you see life shortening. You see um, the decline definitely triggered by the flood, probably the radiation that, that the canopy kept out. It, that is what, you know, the canopy dissipated. And so the radiation came through. You now have cell mutations. You have the immediate acceleration of age process as soon as you say that the cells are mutating and the rugged environment, um, even possibly inadequate nourishment of food everywhere. Because remember, they go find water and then they build their civilization where they could grow crops and, and have the water and the food to eat. But, you know, look at when the pilgrims came to America and many of them lost their lives in the first few years because of the hardships. Um, inbreeding would begin to be a problem now. Greater stress of living would shorten people's lives. So all these are factors that bring it in, that we see uh, that, that it's fact all the way down to where we live, uh, you know, 100 years or less today. Nahor, did I, I don't think I introduced you to him. Verse 23, Saru lived 200 years after became the father of Nahor. And he had other sons and daughters. Now, verse 24, Nahor lived 29 years and became the father of Terah, or Terah. Now, as soon as I say that, I think, oh, the light's gone. We've heard about Terah. We, we know this one. Well, Nahor is a little bit important, too. We want to know him also. Um, just before we leave everybody, one sum. Again, Shem was 320 when Terah was born. And we know Terah is the father of Abram, Abram. He lived 280 years after Terah was born. So Terah is going to born, bought, be born and die in Shem's lifetime. Noah was 822 when Terah, Abram's father, was born. Noah died, like I said, two years before Abram, Abram is born. Um, and again, I don't want to just confuse you, but if you want to go back to all of the years, 
I'll just say it, whether you can follow it or not, it shows why we know that, that Noah, um, because Noah lived at 950 years. We're gonna see that's two years before Abram was born because at 822 when Terah was born, plus the 130 uh, with Terah equals 952. So when you add up the numbers, you can tell how old they were by when the others you know, gave birth. You will see that for Noah to be alive when Auburn was born, he would have had to make it to 952. So he just missed it, okay? And the whore is going to live 148 years. Again, now we're down into the 100s. We're not even in the 200s anymore. Um, but we're going to look at Terah because in his short time, we are introduced to somebody very important. Verse 26, Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Avram, Nahor, and Haram. Okay, now, if you just stop right here at this one verse, you could easily say that Terah had triplets. And he had triplets at 70 years of age, that mm -hmm. he became the father of three sons. But let me give you a little problem with that, okay? Look at um, verse 32. Verse 32 says, the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, we got the name and a place both the same. Don't let that confuse you. Okay, now go to chapter 12. Keep that in mind. Go to chapter 12, verse 4, and here it says, so Abram went forth as the Lord had spoke to him. Lot went with him. Now, Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Okay, so... We're going to know that Terah dies before Avram departs from Haran. Terah dying, Terah lives to be 205. When he dies, Abram is 75. So if you take 205 minus 75, then Terah was 130 when he gave, when, when Avram was born, okay? So we can figure that age for sure. And if we know that, that Terah had to be 130 when Auburn was born because of what these other verses told us, then when we read in verse 26 here of chapter 11, that he's only 70 giving, uh, becoming a father, then obviously he did not become a father to all three sons at the same time. He becomes a father to Avram at, what did I just say, 130, not at 70. So between 70 and 130, we've got 60 years for him to give birth to these three sons. And again, Avram is brought up in the first place, not because he's the firstborn, but because he's going to be the preeminent in importance in what God's wanting to reveal to us through scripture. So um, don't let it throw you. Nahar um, fathers three sons over the span of, of 60 years, and Avram is one of the three, possibly the last out of the three. Um, and that, by the way, then Shem was 450 when Avram was born. Again, when we do the mathematics, okay? Shem died when Avram was 150, or Avram had already lived 75 years in the land of Canaan, when Shem dies. That was a hard one for me to wrap my mind around because again, I wanna put Shem with the ark and now I've got Avram in the land of Canaan, 75 years before Shem dies. So we gotta see their relation. Um, Avram was born 352 years after the flood. Okay, Noah lived 350 years after the flood again, so he missed Avram's birth by two years. So. Let me put it in one simple nutshell, but you have to open it up to see all the goodies that we just ate, okay? From Adom to the time of the flood was 1,656 years. From Adam to the flood, okay? 1,656 years. Now, from the flood to Avram is only 352 years. That's, that's a fraction. That's a fifth of the time. Okay, so Adam to the flood, 656 years. The flood to the time of Abram, 352 years. That means that mankind, from Adam to Abram, we've got about 2,000 years. Okay, 
from Adam to Abraham, approximately. Some put it 2008, some put it 1990 something. So I'm going to just tell you approximately 2000 years that we've had people on this earth now. Now, it's interesting to notice in Genesis, Bereshit has covered more than 2000 years. We're only in chapter 11 and we've covered 2000 years, okay? That's more than 20 generations with a generation being 100 years. But this book also, our Bereshit, our beginning, is going to spend almost one third of its text, one third of its, its scroll, whatever you want to call it. The whole book of Genesis, almost a third of it is going to be spent on the life of one man. We've already spent 2,000 years. We've even started with who you might think, well, Adam would be the most important because he started. But Genesis is saying, nope, there's one so important that it's going to spend a third of its whole writings on this one man. Anyone know who? Jesus. No, 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 no. It, it will see him prefigure that this is, we're going to study the, the lifespan of this man in detail. Who? That's what I'm asking you. Anyone know who? I've been building them up to you. I would say Christ. In Genesis, we're going to spend yeah. a third of yeah. Genesis. Well, I mean, don't they foreshadow? Oh, absolutely, they foreshadow him. Absolutely, but I'm saying who? Who is the man? Yeah. Very good. <laughs> we're right about it. We call him Avram at this point. I think I saw others out in Zoom land that had it, but you were muted. Sorry, folks. But Avram, who Abram, who becomes Abraham. Okay, this is the one we're going to study intently. The first mention of him is going to come in our very next verse. Actually, we've even said it. he became the father of Abram. But we're going to go on with verse 27, and we're going to, to see his name repeated there. He's going to be mentioned 312 times in 272 verses. So more than one time, in, you know, and obviously not in every verse, but there's going to, going to be a whole lot. One of my sources says he could argue, arguably, you could argue that he's the most famous man of the Old Testament because there's so much time spent on him. He certainly was one of the most influential men in history. Now, Genesis is going to cover 2,000 years, going to cover 20 generations, going to give a third of its text to this one man. I tend to think this man is very important. <laughs> And the first hint that I see of that, I can't say first hint, but in what I know of Avram, which makes me agree, he is described in a very special way. I love this description. He is <laughs> described in scripture as a friend of God. What oh, chapter and that one then was here? Let's look at that. Where do we see him called a friend of God? And if you're rapidly running through Genesis, you're not going to find it. <laughs> but other scriptures talk about him. Let's go to one of those other scriptures. The first one we'll go to is James chapter 2 and verse 23. James chapter 2, verse 23. Okay, tablet. Uh, James? James, in the New Covenant. We got to go all the way to James. I'm having trouble with mine. That'll give you a chance to find it before I get there. Okay. And I'm getting there. James chapter 2 and verse 23. Okay? And you've got to say to yourself, wow, he's not only in one-third of the book of Genesis, but now we get almost to the end of the writings that God has put into our Bible. And Avram, Abraham, his name is coming up. Verse 23 says, the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Avraham, believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. James 2.23. Now let me back up and show you somewhere else. Second Chronicles. Now we're back in um, Israel history time. Um, Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. Times of the Kings and all of that. Okay, Second Chronicles, and we're going to go to chapter 20. Second Chronicles 20. There we go. Second Chronicles 20 and verse 7. And in Second Chronicles 20, verse 7, it says, Did you not, O our God, drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel 
and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever. Wow. He's been like called a friend of God twice now. Out of the mouth of three witnesses. Let's go to Yeshia, Isaiah chapter 41. And in Isaiah chapter 41, we're going to look at verse 8. Isaiah 41 and verse 8. And this is God speaking himself. So we've heard it from James. We've heard it in the Chronicles of the Kings. And now God is saying, but you, Israel, my servant, Yaakov, Jacob, whom I've chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. Well, if God says it, it's true. <laughs> so I think that's really special to be called the friend of God. And to me is one of the ultimate compliments that one could have in this. I think it is the only one that he's even mentioned that he's a friend of God, isn't it? I think Moshe gets it also. Moshe. Moses. I think. I think it comes to my mind, but let me look, I let me look so. and see. Uh, you could be right. You could be right. I want to I want to help you understand how important it is to have that that word friend. And to have a friend in a high place, Abraham had a friend in the most high place, okay? Abraham, well, uh, let me use it in my English, okay? One that's in our history was named after Abraham of the scriptures. Um, he, had a, a, he was born in a log cabin. He was born on a very stormy night. A midwife of sorts. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> <laughs> I got A plus students. What can I say? <laughs> Just fell on my thunder. But if you don't know, that midwife that showed up and helped the mother give birth when she almost would have died and the baby would have died also, it was miraculous. And if the story is true, the story is told that when she was going out the door, the family asked the next morning after Abraham had been born, and this is Abraham Lincoln, if you didn't hear my live room, shout out the answer. Um, they asked, what can we pay you? They wanted to pay her for her services. And she said, just, just name him Abraham. And it was supposed to be after Abraham in the Bible. That's how he got named. Um, she went out the door. I don't remember what it was that caused them to suddenly remember something they didn't want to give to her or say to her. And one ran to that door. Remember now, it had been snowing the night before. They opened the door, could not see anyone as far as I could see. And there oh, were no footprints in the snow. Oh yeah. my God. That's if that's awesome. a true story, we know that was that was uh, angelic. Whether it's true or not, I'm not here to tell you. But Abraham Lincoln, who was in the place of presidency, would once received a pardon. I'm sorry, he received a request for a pardon for a man who had deserted the army. And it was fully expected that Abraham Lincoln would have turned him down. There was no reason to give this man a pardon. Abraham Lincoln was told this man has no friends. Abraham said, then I will be his friend and I will pardon him. He ended up with a friend in a high place. We have men and women that are famous all the way through scripture for different reasons. Abraham's going to be famous for his faith. That's critical to me. He's famous for his faith and he gets this description. Moses, if he got the description, and we're going to look and see, um, he's known to, for being a, a great lawgiver. He gave us the law. You put Moses and the Ten Commandments together almost instantaneously in your thoughts. I could take you to David, and what would you say, David? A great king. I could take you, shepherd and king, okay? I could take you to Eliyahu, Elijah. Oh, he was a great prophet. All of these people, great faith. We see it in Hebrews 11, a lot of them mentioned in the Hall of Faith. We see all of that. But what I want to point out is because of faith, we can have that relationship. We can be a friend of God. We can have God as our friend. Now, you might say, oh, wait a minute. I don't have the kind of faith like Abraham has. I don't equal that. I can't walk in those kind of shoes. Fine. That isn't how he got it. God was Abraham's friend. Mm -hmm. God is the one who does it. Do you have faith in God? Then God can build your faith, and you can have that same kind of relationship. And if you want to say to me, oh, I could never have that kind of faith, you exercise faith every day. 
How many of you are sitting down right now? <laughs> Everybody but me. Yeah. And, and I'm Goddard or Dora, whoever said it. When you sat on that chair, did you look at that chair first and examine it, test it out, and put something heavy on it? You hope to put something heavier than you so that when you sit on it, you don't collapse? <laughs> no. You simply sat down. You had faith that chair was going to hold you up. You buy tickets. You'll buy tickets on a plane to fly somewhere. That shows you've got faith in that plane, in the pilot, the mechanics, all of that. Now, some of you are saying, yeah, that's why I don't fly. Okay, have you bought a ticket to a sporting event? Okay, do you expect that to, to take place? You expect to take your ticket and get your seat, which you're not going to check out. You're going to just sit in because you know it's going to hold you up. There could be a ticket scandal and you might not have a real ticket to a real sporting event. We all know of stories like that that have happened. You can have a plane fall out of the sky. You don't get to that destination that you had faith you'd get to. You can have, oh, the weatherman said it's going to be sunny. I'm going to plan a picnic for this weekend, and it can pour rain on you. Like that one Sunday. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, like one Sunday that happened to Loretta recently. But you still go on having faith. You still buy another ticket. You still get on another plane. You still do your picnic. You still sit in another chair. You do have faith. Yeah. God can take your little faith and he can build it. And you and he can have that same relationship. I want to hear God say, Rochelle's my friend. And that's what I'm hoping, holding out to every single one of you also. I have someone that likes to describe me that way when they introduce me. And every time I hear my little heart says, yes, please, Lord, please, Lord. I want you to say, that. I know I say it. He's my friend. He's my best friend. And he's my father. <laughs> and he's my daddy. And I talk to him every day and I listen to him every day. I, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, I've got the relationship, but I want to hear him say Ah, there's Rochelle. There's my friend. Oh, I smell her prayers again. And I hear her cries. I love her. I'm her awful dad. Yes. And that's what I'm holding out to you. Avram, who we're going to revere. We're going to respect. That's a better word, I think, right now. I revere God. But I'll respect Avram. We're going to study him. We're going to see him. We're going to see he's got ups and he's got downs. But we're going to see his faith. I don't want you to think for a moment, this is Superman. No. You know what he did in the morning when he got up? He was human. He ate breakfast. <laughs> he probably had a way to wash his face. I imagine he put on clothes for the day. I don't think he slept and, and wore 24-7 all his life. He changed clothes. And if it were pants, he'd put on his pants one leg at a time, <laughs> just like all of us. This is my point. He's a real person. He lived a real life on this earth the same way that we're real people living real lives today. So what we see in him, it's not out of our reach. We can have this kind of life with our God that we're going to see he has. And I'm excited to get us into it. So let's go on. Let's move forward. We'll go back to Genesis 11 because we're not quite into Auburn yet. Maybe we'll be... It will have the introductory remarks of him. We have some introductory, but a little more before this class ends, we'll see. It depends on how long-winded Rochelle gets. And we all know, worry about that one, <laughs> okay? So back in here, he's been born in chapter 11 and verse 26. Verse 27 tells us, now these are the records of the generations of Terah. That's Terah's signature. He's saying, here's my genealogical records that I'm passing down. That's where his end. Now, the next one is going to pick up the genealogical records. We're going to read about that in Genesis 25, 19. They were probably kept by Yitzhak, Isaac. It was probably Abraham kept them passing out to Yitzhak, and Yitzhak is the one who's going to sign off that we're going to see the next time because he was 75 years old when his father died. So he easily could have been the keeper of the records by that point. Abram easily could have passed them down to his son. Okay? So Terah be, became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. I'm not repeating chapter, I mean, verse 27 is. And Haran became the father of Lot. 
Okay, we're going to learn about Lot in a little bit. Verse 28, Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of his birth, in Ur of the Chaldeans. Okay, so obviously Haran lives a shorter life because his father outlives him. That happens today, sadly, too. Um, where did they live? They lived in Ur of the Chaldeans. Okay, now Ur is one of the oldest, if not the most ancient city of Chaldea. When they're called Chaldeans, it's because they're from Chaldea. When we're called Americans, it's because we're from America. Okay, this was in southern Mesopotamia. It's about six miles away from the Euphrates River and about 125 miles from the Persian Gulf. So if you're familiar with that area, that's the area. It's believed that Ur at one time was probably right on the Euphrates, but with the way that the rivers go, the deposits of silt and salt and this and that, that there's been enough of a change at six miles difference now. The same way that I can tell you back in biblical times, Beit Lechem, Bethlehem was six miles south of Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem has really encroached on Bethlehem, and you almost don't know when you've crossed out of Jerusalem and into Bethlehem if there weren't signs to tell you. It's that close now. It's that built up. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Does the ground or the city just moved? Or... Oh, In that it... case, the city grew. The city moved. Oh, it grew. It grew. In this case, the river changed. You know, just like you had nomadic um, routes that changed, you know, with the course of time with things that happened that, that caused it. Rivers that flooded that, that they couldn't get across, they had to go new ways, you know. So things change. But for Jerusalem to be that close to Bethlehem, it's because Jerusalem grew more than Bethlehem grew. Tel Aviv was the baby. Jaffa, 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 you hear that? You know, Jonah from Jaffa? Mm -hmm. That was original. Tel Aviv was sand dunes in the 1920s. I'm, I'm pretty safe saying in the 1920s, sand dunes. Now Tel Aviv is huge and it's the metropolis and Chop is just this little art colony. It's very small. <laughs> and Tel Aviv has encroached on Chop. You know, you're, you're almost on top of each other. So those things happen. But Ur was a very well advanced city even before the time of Avraham, even before we're being introduced to it here with Avraham. Excavations show that there was a level of material welfare that was equal to that of Babylon in Nebuchadnezzar's time. And Babylon in Nebuchadnezzar's time, he was the head of gold in the image that you see. It was very wealthy. It was very well developed. That's a thousand years later. Okay. And it's saying that this Ur of the Chaldees was equal to Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon more than a thousand years earlier. It was a center of manufacturing, farming, shipping. It was a land of fertility and it had wealth because it had caravans going in every direction to distant lands. It even had ships that did sail from the docks of Ur down the Persian Gulf. So it was the way that it went. So it was the hot spot. It was like the hub and the wheel around it. And it had its spokes going out in every direction. And that's why you see civilization so developed. Things that, that came, um, I don't know that I can quote it, you know, but the example that comes to my mind is like, you'll hear spices from India, you know, came to a certain area. How did they come? By the caravans bringing them. We know caravans traveled all the time. When we read about Joseph, um, who's not that far off of Avram's age, we'll read about a caravan that carries him away in slavery. And it wasn't anything, you know, it wasn't like, who is this people? No, this was a regular caravan route. So caravan routes brought the exchange of culture. If this area was wealth in spices, this one was wealth in materials, this one was wealth in agriculture, they brought it all in. It would be like going down to our docks in Long Beach and you see all these boxes that come in that have everything from around the world. Yeah. The crates, the crates, yeah. Mm -hmm. It would be like that. Excavations of the Royal Cemetery that date back 2900 to 2500 BC. Okay, so we're back, because remember, Abraham, we're about 2000 years. So we're right in that time. It shows from the cemetery a surprisingly advanced culture, especially in arts and crafts. They had beautiful jewelry. They had art treasures. They had exquisite china. They had crystal. They had cargoes of copper. 
and they had what was called a hard stone. I, I imagine kind of like a marble maybe. And it was considered the most magnificent city of the world before Abraham's time. So you've got a bustling city here. You have whatever you think of that's, that's the most, you know, I can't think of an example. Um, New before York City Abraham. for, yes, before Abraham. Because often we think, oh, this was where civilization was just developing. We're picturing swamp. We're picturing huge farms. We're picturing sparse population. No, this was a thriving community. And it had everything coming and going. It also had bricks there that they have found, they've uncovered in, in archaeology, that still contain the names of heathen gods. So the worship of heathen gods going on. Well, we knew that from the Tower of Babel. They were worshiping gods. Remember, it was the gateway for the gods to come down and be among the people and receive the offerings that they were giving to the gods. They especially found the name Nanner, N-A-N-N-A-R, Nanner and interesting. In our English, the word is sin, S I N. But sin was the name of the moon god. They know that. I found that interesting because Allah is really the name for the moon god in uh, Islam. And wow. it was sin at this time. And the bricks are computed to be 38 centuries old. That means that they believe, because of the material and it, that the, you know, the brick was, that it came back from 38. 100 BC. Man goes back about 4,000 BC. So you've got it almost back to, uh, to Adam. Can I ask you, now where did all that stuff come from? I mean, you know, if all that you're saying, where did it come from? I mean, who made it? I mean, copper comes out of mines. God put that into the earth. Brick stone comes out of the mines. The um, agricultural development would be God gave them brilliant minds. Adam knew how to name all the animals and how to, to cultivate the, car, the Garden of Eden. The first occupation was farming. It just was farming with no weeds and no problems. Hello, <laughs> sweetheart. Kitties come out of nowhere, too. <laughs> we see he's, he's used to this box being his, <laughs> for any of you who don't know. So I will just simply shift here. Um, so some of it was like the jewelry and all was what they learned to develop themselves. How did they? How did the Egyptians know to make these mirrors that we can't even emulate today? They say that the mirror of the Egyptian women is better than the mirror of the American women today. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that they made out of uh, a brass and out of a copper it was amazing. I was just studying that in relation to the tabernacle when the um, labor was made. And remember, they gave their jewels and all, you know, to make the tabernacle um, implements. And they were saying that's why that, that labor had to been brilliantly, you know, the mirror reflecting, the water purifying. What a picture of how when we are washed in the water, then our reflection takes on from, from our God. That's, that's amazing. So it came out of their, the, the brilliance God gave man to develop, that he put everything into this earth, the stones and all, you know, the materials, the things that, that were used. God created this earth. Remember, he created it beautiful. The brain spin is, was more, more thriving than it is today compared to what we got today. I, I think that's what they're saying, that when they could do the pyramids and things like that, that their brains were working better than our brains are today. Again, is man improving? Or is man showing that depravity is still there and he is not improving? I think God is going to restore slowly for for a short time. The millennial will be amazing. Yeah. The, you know, the temple alone will be amazing, let alone mm -hmm. the the re <laughs> respiration, the respiration of the earth. Yeah. Yeah. And God's eternal, oh my goodness. Is people who think they're gonna be bored in heaven, they haven't a clue. I mean, even just explore heaven, let alone the heavens. You know, <laughs> I could go on and on. But let me tell you about a ziggurat because we know what a ziggurat is now that they uncovered. They believe the ziggurat was patterned after the Tower of Babel, and it was a solid mass of brick. I think that's why it survived. It was 200 feet by 150 feet by 70 feet high, wow. and on the top of it was a shrine to the moon god Sin. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Pretty amazing. I mean, there's no caveman mentality in there. 
Was yeah. there anything left of the temple? Of the, the first temple, the second yeah. temple, which are you be talking what about? What did the wailing wall come from? It's the, the question was asked, was there anything left of the temple? And when I was asking her to get more specific, which era is she talking about? She said, where'd the wailing wall, which is known today as a Western wall, where did it come from? That was a retaining wall built around the temple mount where the temple was up here and the wall was around. Um, retaining was for protection, for strength and all of that. That's what has still stood and the reason why it's so tall is we call it the sands of time, but it is each civilization built on top of the next. If you want to get back to the, the level of the street in Bible times, you've got to go down 20, 20 feet to get just to the level. So archaeology has dug this up when they've found there's something under the, sur the, the dirt, the surface, and they dig and they find something. I walked on streets that were the actual pavement in the time of Yeshua Jesus, and they're 20 feet down. You'll see a part of a gate, like the top of a gate, that they haven't excavated down yet because there was a city that was before Yeshua's time in that area. Whoa. If you go to Megiddo, where the Battle of Armageddon will be fought, they have so many, I think it is 20 civilizations that they know built on top, on top, on top, on top. It is amazing. And they've discovered it all through archaeology, but you see a lot of that around Israel. So the Western Wall down low was where it, the level was of the day. And as civilization would build up, they keep building on a wall. That's why you'll see the, the um, and you can see it in Leda's background if you a little bit can't see it well, but that's the, the Western Wall, if you can see her picture. Um, you'll see different stones of different uh, sh shapes and sizes, kind of. It all blends, but you, they can tell what era, they can tell when that was added on by the way it was um, carved. That wasn't part of the, it was not part of the temple. Not part of the temple, the wall so around the temple. Around it. Yes. Yeah, when you're at the Western Wall, you're down here. When you wanna go up to the temple area, you go to the side of the Western Wall, there's a ramp up and you come up onto the Temple Mount area. If I could show you quickly an aerial view, if you've ever seen an aerial view that's showing you the Temple Mount in Israel, you see how it's, it's like on a platform and it's been leveled on the top, but it's part of the mountain, it's part of Mount Moriah. And you, you can see then and begin to understand better. I can bring you pictures and show you that. Uh, but no, there's nothing left of the temple itself. There is a new cornerstone that the Temple Mount faithful have that they want to lay in on the Temple Mount to start the rebuilding of the third temple. Every time they try, it breaks out and riot because it hasn't been God's time. And, and it's the, coming soon. The stones in the temple have gold in them. Uh, they were called golden because of the, 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 when the light would hit it, they'd shine like gold, but the um, cement in between, what do you call it? You know, the mortar, the mortar in between is what I understand had gold. The stones are stone, but they use gold in the mortar, putting them together. Yeah, making it enriching. Because remember, they wanted it as beautiful as they could make it. So it was in the mortar. So how did the wall? They fell even over the ground, but how did they work it out? The same way, the same way that you do today. They had they somebody drew out the architectural plans. They had the stone quarry where they carved out the stones according to the plans. They had they took them up to the temple mount, up that mount, and they laid them according to the pattern to build the temple. So very much like we do today, but of course it wasn't on paper, it was on papyrus or whatever, but uh, the waiting wall was part of that wall. Yes, was part of the wall. It's still standing. Represents the Jew, is what they say, because the Jew is still standing. It shouldn't be, but is because of God. When you end, we have another question that her bugging is. Okay. We got a question coming at the end. So those of you who would like to go on like Bible discussion, stay tuned. But uh, let me get to wrapping up point, or maybe we can stop here. Let's see. Well, let me get you their lives, okay? And then we'll find out, because we're starting into Avram's life now. So if we have begun to introduce you to this one called the friend of God. 
And we know that he had brothers. We know that one of his brothers, Haran, died before their father, Terah, died. Haran died in the Ur of the Chaldees. That was the place he was born. So um, Haran didn't go far. He, he was right there. Abram and Nahor, the two that are left, grow up to the age where they took wives. The name of Abram's wife is Sarah, Sarah at this point called Sarai, um, or Sarai is how you guys say it. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milka. She was the daughter of Haran. That tells us Haran married. He was old enough to be married. We just don't know who he married because the Bible doesn't record it, but he had a daughter by the name of Milka, and the father of Milka um, was also the father of Iska. So Haran had at least Milka and his Iska. He had at least two children. Those are both female names, I'm told. So I get the idea Haran did not die with a son to carry the name down. Uh, but he passes out of the picture, and um, Nahor's wife is Milka. Basically, he married his brother's daughter. <laughs> Stay tuned. Next week, I'll play for you if I can get Roger to get the link. I am my own grandfather. I listened to it and laughed. I can't follow it. There's a portion that I will tell you who's related to whom. And I'll tell you, honestly, I took my source and trusted it because I get lost. If you can do that once removed and all of that, have fun. Okay? But at this point, Sarai, verse 30, was barren. She had no child. Okay? Now, Sarai is actually Avram's half-sister. How do I know that? Look real quick, Genesis 20 and verse 12. We're going to um, come back to this later, obviously, but let me just tie us up right now. Genesis 20 and verse 12, when we find out, Avram's the one speaking, and he's saying, besides she, referring to Sarai, actually is my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. So Sarah marries his half-sister, Nahor marries his sister. This was okay back at this time. Later, we're going to see God's going to tell him not to. But at this time, God kept the gene pool pure enough for there to be the, the development of the, the races, of, of the people, of humanity. How can I put this? So, um, Okay, so when Adam actually said she is my sister, she actually exists. When Abraham said that, yes, yes. When Abraham said it, yes. And some say, well, then it was a half life. Was that was that when he's talking to the king? You know the stories. You know a little bit about Abram. Yes. They asked me, was this then when Abram said to that king, King of them, Abimelech, was, you know, he told him that she's his sister. Yes. Truthfully, she was his yeah, half sister. So it was a half the truth because he was leaving out the truth that she's not just my sister, she's my wife. And God intervenes because he didn't tell everything he was supposed to tell. But I think we will stop there because we're beginning to develop who he is, who he marries, who he's related to. But like I say, hang on because in, in the next lesson, when we get into all, I mean, it's, I'm glad God kept the records because if he left them to me, We'd not know who came from who, <laughs> but God will bring it out. And we're going to see a lot that we can learn from Abram from this one called the friend of God. But let me encourage you. Um, let me just finish with this note, even though somebody's phone is ringing. <laughs> and I'll repeat this next week. But what we're seeing is um, Genesis 1 through 11, and especially chapter 11, we see man's plan. Man tries to build the tower. Man wants what he wants. Then we see it shift, and we're seeing God's plan for man in chapter 12 on with, with Abram here. And in humanity, we see that there's, uh, because we're just now breaking up into the nations. We're just now finding out how the people develop. We see a vast stream that I'm going to take you prior to that. I'm going to say the vast stream of humanity. We've got all of this humanity because out of it comes all the nations, the Koreans, the Swedes, the Italians, the Mexicans, the um, whoever, all y'all, okay? All, everything. In that vast stream, God's gonna call one man. He's gonna call Abraham. 
and he's going to create out of Abram, out of one man, he's going to make a whole nation. Out of that nation, he's going to bring the Messiah, the promised one that we read about in Genesis 3.15, that Satan tried to say, oh, here's the fulfillment of that, and he was more than dead wrong. But if I took it from the vast sea of humanity, I'm going to say that God picks a little riverlet. I'm, I'm not even going to call it a river. It's a little riverlet. He takes that little riverlet to bring salvation that's going to purify the great river, the great sea, the great vastness of humanity of the world. Out of this one little, he's going to bring it. He takes that nation. And out of that nation, that's worshiping the one true God, that recognizes one true God. And he thrusts that out in a way that we see the vast sea of idolatry is wrong. There's one true God, and he worked through one man who he made a nation come out of, who out of that nation, the seed, singular, would be born. And we read about that in Revelation 12 when it says that the woman who gave birth to the seed, to the son. And we know that's, that's Israel giving birth to Messiah, not physically. We know Miriam miraculously did that. But we see that God's going to use one little nation to receive and to preserve divine revelation. This is what amazes me to see out of one man, out of one little nation that's still a tiny little nation to this day, we're going to see the divine revelation given and preserved that is the human channel for the Messiah that's going to be the savior of the entire world. Is that not amazing? God's got all this vastness, brings it down, and in one for <clears throat> And he doesn't choose the big, he doesn't choose the best, he doesn't choose what you think, oh, here's the crowning glory. He chooses a little grunt. And look what God does out of that. So good note to end up. Come back next week. A long ways from that seed being born. We won't get it in its fulfillment in Genesis, but we'll keep getting pictures and of what the life of that seed would be. And we all know I'm talking about the Messiah. So fascinates me to see how God started it all, masterminded it. Can you imagine creating out of nothing creation and then creating man in that creation and planning 6,000 years of man's existence and at certain specific times through certain specific ones to fulfill his huge plan for the entire world. Anyone want to try to counter that? <laughs> Anyone think, oh, how smart and how much better man is 6,000 years later? Really? <laughs> really? I stand in humble awe at how great is our God. Let's close and pray. Lord God, thank you for being so mighty, so powerful, all-knowing, Nothing is beyond you, and nothing existed before you, and nothing exists after you. You are the God of us above all. And Lord, how thankful we are that you chose to come into humanity, to come in through the race of one, to be the Savior for the entire world. Wow. What a plan, and how thankful we are. You are worthy of our praise, worthy of our honor. We do adore you as long as there is day and into our eternal forever, Lord. We praise and we thank you. You are amazing. And we thank you for even putting a face on in a way that we could understand and relate to. Oh, God, how we thank you in the Son of God, Yeshua Jesus, the two and one, and the Spirit, Ruch HaKodesh, who brings us into our hearts and our minds, quickens it within us, that we can grasp hold of these truths that are beyond all. We praise you, we thank you, we say hallelujah in your holy name. Amen. What a God. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay.
comments, questions. I know we got a question over here, but anything on the class question first before we let whatever that's going to obviously take us off a little different. Um, open up your mics, share, run for the hills. <laughs> <laughs> 